I'm going to talk about language and computation a little bit, but I'm going to try and end up with derivatives, okay? And I'll try to end up with Perry Merling's uh, uh, formalization diagram that um, both ex, uh, Jorge, and Dick. Jorge and Dick talked about. Uh, this course called The Economics of Banking and Finance is the, the most popular economics course on Coursera. All right, and uh, it's, it's uh, been quite influential in our thinking. All right, well, the computational models of language really, uh, really start with uh, a 1956 article by Noam Chomsky. It's the, uh, the famous uh, Chomsky hierarchy and uh, denumerated these different types of grammars into four categories. I won't go into them. Uh, most of you probably uh, know about this material. But uh, at that time, uh, Chomsky's uh, particular type of grammar was a phase structure grammar and um, a categorical grammar. And um, it was a constituency grammar. It was basically modeled on a subject predicate uh, structure of sentences and divided sentences, a sentence into a noun phrase and a verb phrase and furthermore subgrammatical categories ending up with a lexicon, basically a, a a set of words, all right? And the idea was that everybody had the same grammar. And you just then adjusted it to the moment of speaking, all right? So this is a kind of a top-down model, all right? What we're gonna propose is that the types of protocols that uh, EXA is proposing in Gravity deal with distributed networks and they actually work on a different model. And some of you will know uh, one formal variant of those models are uh, things called Montague grammars. All right. Montague grammars were used Kripke semantics, Kripke's work on modal logic, to try and deal with reference shift. And things like uh, indexical elements, the pragmatic elements of language like tense, uh, first and second pro pronouns, but not third person pronouns. Words like this and that shift reference with every moment of speaking. And they produce lots and lots of problems for logics. Okay, so this was, the, I won't go into that. That's Frege's you know, great discovery, how to deal with it with a sense and reference. But we're basically proposing that instead of a centralized top-down model, what you want to deal with with distributed networks to, re, to reach, you might say, their imminent social potential is to start from pragmatic indexical speech events and build up. So it's a kind of, instead of disintermediation, as John has been said, it's sort of remediation from it's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer model from the bottom up. And this leads to a different notion of language. And that's what's been called a metapragmatic grammar because the pragmatic elements of language, like dictics and tense, those are pragmatic, any coordination of them has to be a meta-language, and it's called metapragmatics. Okay, so that's the material I'm gonna go through. All right, a metapragmatic grammar has a different starting point, as I said. Instead of starting with the program inside of a centralized computer, imagine a distributed network of computers who talk to one another. The analogy to language agents talking to one another and making offers and other ages accepting them is exactly the heart of gravity. Given that any speech event occurs in a particular time and place, its meaning must be at least partially determined by the moment and context of speaking, and these will shift. All right. So from the unbounded class of all possible utterances and speech events, the real question is how do you coordinate them so that Anybody speaking the same language has the ability to interpret all the utterances. Okay, that's the, that's the problem. Since this coordinates pragmatic linguistic elements, we call this a metapragmatic grammar. What gravity does as a distributed protocol is define what well-formed formed utterances are, their uptake and interpretation, and orders discrete call them utterances, that is, offers and acceptances, into a time series 
defined by their causal dependencies, and actually the model of that is the netting and clearing model that you saw earlier that Dick showed. That is, that segments these events when you net them, let's say at the end of the day, you're taking all these events and say they equal this number, right? That's the net effect, right? But what is the structure of this basic interaction of offer and match? Now, this is very interesting. It actually reduplicates the pronoun structure of language. There's an I and a U, but the I and the U have to make an agreement and have to be able to talk about not only their own offer, but other offers. That's the third person. What's the third person in language? It's the non-person. He, she, it, they are the people who are not present in the ongoing utterance. So you see, even in the pronoun structure, the whole structure of the self-reflexivity of language. That's the principle we're unraveling. And what I'm going to talk about very briefly is the social implications of that unraveling. What this metapragmatic principle will give you, and I'm going to argue that it will give you a derivative. <laughs> OK? So this, this is, I'm not sure this is right. It, it, it's kind of wild. But I'm going to start with, of all things, pre-capitalist societies. I'm an anthropologist, and I also have a philosophy appointment. But anthropologists live on the gift. That's, in some sense, the gift societies are what we study, supposedly. And gift societies are usually defined in terms of pre-capitalist and basically very primitive forms, or none at all, of money. All right. I want to argue that the gift-counter-gift -gift relationship is actually a derivative relationship. OK. Now, what's the gift-counter-gift -gift relationship? All right. The history of this is kind of interesting. It starts with Levi-Strauss, and it's about the exchange of women. And there are wife givers and wife receivers among these societies. They were usually uh, Australian Aborigine societies, and they were maintained by the incest taboo. This is uh, Levi-Strauss in the 1950s. But the biz big idea was that this notion of exchange could redefine societies into, di into different typologies. You wouldn't, for instance, do what the British did, was follow descent lines. You would basically create a systematic model of society out of basically now, I'll use this word, swaps. <laughs> swaps. What you're swapping are claims and obligations. When you give a gift, right, what these societies do, when you give a gift, everybody knows if they accept the gift, they have to give a counter gift. If I take your daughter, I'm going to have to give my daughter, maybe another generation later, and maybe with a dowry. Between those intervals, anything can happen. So there's a lot of volatility. You already see what's happening, right? Social volatility before expiration, that's an option. Right? Think about it. All right. So what happens? These people, these different lineages, will develop gift relationships with all sorts of other clans and build basically a portfolio of claims and obligations determined by the volatility to expiration. So the counter gift actually ratifies the value of the gift, discounted to the present. Mm -hmm. That's the social derivative that exists before money. Now, Bourdieu, the famous anthropologist and sociologist, actually argued that, what do you maximize if you don't have money? And he said, you maximize things like honor, fame, face, all these qualitative intensities and affects. The exact thing that 
behavioral science relegates to a separate corner into uh, system one in Kahneman's terms. All right. So what I wanted to indicate was that, in fact, the gift and counter gift is a volatility instrument. It's not a directional instrument. And one of the big things that you learn in derivative finance is that it's commonly misunderstood what options really are. And I'll just read you an interesting quote by a guy named Sally Nefsky, who was a quant. Um, let's see if I have this. And you'll begin to see why the significance of volatility will be. And I'll try to derive volatility out of, and this is what Perry says, all of banking, it simply is, it's a swap of IOUs, the swap of credit. Mm -hmm. All of money based, is basically a derivative finance. So I'll just give you uh, Perry's quote. Perfect. He says, and then I'll give the analysis and I'll end. The place where money meets finance is in a kind of financial derivative called a swap, since all banking is essentially a swap of IOUs. But I already said, claims and obligations, you just replace the, with assets and liabilities. And you can see it's the same argument, except you don't have a quantitatively ratio scale like money. You have qualitative intensities. But what are qualitative intensities? You know that this gives me more honor than something else. You just can't say, this gives me twice as much honor as something else. All right. All right, so let me just uh, uh, read this last quote by Sally, and then we can have discussion about this later. Yeah. In the traditional textbooks approach, options are introduced as directional instruments. This is not how market professionals think of options. In most textbooks, a call option becomes in the money and hence profitable if the underlying price increases and directly associating it with a bullish view. The treatment of put options is similar. Puts are seen as appropriate from an investor who thinks the price is going to decrease. For an end investor or retail client, such directional motivations for options may be natural. But looking at options this way is misleading if we are concerned with the interbank or interdealer market. In fact, motivating options as directional instruments will disguise the fundamental aspect of these instruments, mm. namely that options are tools for trading volatility. Anytime you have an agreement about price, you're actually picking the bid and ask from a volatility spread. That is the alternative prices that could have satisfied so inherently, a contract is a volatility instrument. Mm -hmm. All right, options simply work out the logic of contracts by increasing the interval of time. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. That's the principle by which we're trying to investigate and move for further this idea that money can be seen in some sense yeah. as a swap of IOUs. Okay, thanks. Perfect, thanks, Ben. John?